As I mentioned, my family was able to get away for several days and, and go have a time of, of rest and a long visit with Nanny and Poppy down in Okeechobee. As predicted, there was not a lot happening in Okeechobee other than cattle grazing and oranges growing. Uh, there were two rodeos in town while we were there, but not much else happening. And so a lot of what I was doing, uh, in addition to just spending time with, with family, was um, I, I was working on a little project. Some, some months ago, uh, I was approached by one of our Baptist publishing houses and asked if I would write some Sunday school lessons. So I had let that assignment kind of delay a little long and was needing to do some catch-up work. So I'd get up early in the morning and walk down to the coffee shop on the corner and do some study and some writing. And uh, it, it was great, you know, after the first couple days of trying to explain that I wanted half a cup of decaf and half of it with toasted almond regular coffee in it. By the end of the week, I was running on Duncan. They knew me as a regular. And uh, the next last day I walked in, they asked if I wanted the usual. The last day I walked in, they just handed me my coffee. So, I mean, I felt like a local. I felt as though I had arrived. And so I would sit there and I would write. It was great. Now, there was one day that I was there that something happened that, that has really stuck with me. It's quite meaningful to me. And I want to share it with you today. I was sitting there. Uh, studying this, this passage from John chapter 3, where Nicodemus, a, a religious leader, wants to have this conversation with Jesus. And as I was working on verse 14 about raising up the Son of Man, uh, something happened at the, at the next table. And I wasn't eavesdropping. Well, eventually I was eavesdropping, but at first I wasn't eavesdropping. I wasn't trying to listen in to what was happening. It was just this, this nice, young, professional gentleman came in, uh, well-dressed, polite, well-spoken, sat down at the table. He was, he was facing the door, and, and it seemed as though everyone who came through the door was someone he knew. Now, Okeechobee is a small town, and I expected for a lot of this to be going on in the coffee shop, but it wasn't. This particular coffee shop is right on the main drag through town. It seemed to be much more of a commuter crowd than anybody local, except for this fella. It seemed as though everyone who came through the door not only was someone that he knew, it was somebody for whom he had a nickname or a special greeting. I think I even saw a few special handshakes thrown in, and everybody would not only speak to him, hey, good to see you, how you doing, but they would get out of line and come first to his table and kiss his ring and say, Godfather, no, that's, that's not exactly what happened. They, but they would come over and say hello to him and have more than just a passing greeting. That, this went on for about 30 minutes uh, until someone came through the door and his entire experience of the room changed. The person who came from, through the door was a very petite, older woman who turned out to be Mama. And Mama sat down across the table from him, and now it was her table and her coffee shop. And she was in control of the conversation, and he was paying his respect to her. And, and at first, I really wasn't aware of any difference, but as they continued on and as their conversation continued, I was able to hear snippets of it, truly not trying to listen in, just they were, they were at the next table. And I began to realize that she was uh, keeping him at the table by gently sort of refusing, sort of redirecting the conversation away from the topic that he wanted to discuss and back to a series of topics she wanted to discuss. See, he had called this meeting with Mama to talk about money. He needed some cash. She had come to the table to talk about everything else that she wanted to talk about, knowing that until they talked about cash, he had to stay there and, and talk to her. And boy, he got nervous as she tried to talk about uh, his relationship with his brother. And as uh, she tried to talk about what this money would mean for his relationship with his brother and, and some business interests on the side and so on and so forth. 
She wanted to talk about his life and the choices he was making, what his values were, and all these sorts of things. And he was so uncomfortable with this that at one point he even took a phone call right in front of Mama, took a phone call and got up from the table and went into the corridor where uh, the restrooms were located so that he could have this long conversation and avoid her at the table. If I was reading his mind correctly, I think what he was doing was, was hoping that by stepping away from the table, she would lose her train of thought, and when he came back to the table, they could finally talk about money. Mama was way ahead of this. Uh, she was ready. As soon as he got back to the table, she redirected back to the talk about family. Finally, she let the conversation move to what he wanted to discuss, money, and by the time, at the time that she agreed that $1,000 would be deposited in his account, they were out of the parking lot and gone within just a matter of moments. So all the while that this conversation is playing out at the next table, I'm looking back and forth. I'm, I'm, I'm looking back at John chapter 3, verse 14. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So must the Son of Man be lifted up. There's a lot of ways to take uh, that phrase, that statement. The Son of Man must be lifted up. Uh, at least five ways that I know of to interpret that passage. The first one is revealed uh, as Jesus refers back to a passage from the Old Testament involving Moses. It's a story uh, from, from Numbers uh, during, the, uh, during the Exodus. As God's people, as, as the Hebrew people are wandering in the wilderness and they begin to grumble against Moses, talking about how this life of freedom that we thought we wanted and into which we're following Moses it wasn't all that it's cracked up to be. In fact, we may have had it better back in Egypt. May, we were slaves, but at least we knew what life was going to be then. And as judgment against them, God brings snakes into their camp and people begin to be frightened and run from these snakes. And so uh, God instructs Moses to raise up a serpent so that all who see it and all who uh, call upon the name of the Lord, presumably, and all who return to a right relationship with God may be saved. Now, the comparison is, is not between Jesus and a snake. The comparison is between the salvation that comes through the serpent being raised up by Moses, the raising up, and the salvation that comes by the raising up of the Son of Man, by raising up Jesus. So that's, that's one interpretation, is that it's a reference to this Old Testament passage. But there's several others. A second interpretation of that passage is, is that I have and you have and all have raised Jesus up in that it was my wrongdoing, my wrong words, my wrong living, my poor decisions, my flawed character that has raised Jesus up and nailed him to the cross for my sin. For all of those ways that I have chosen to live a life that runs counter to what the Lord would desire for me, counter to the life that God created me to experience, I have raised Jesus up and nailed him to the cross to take my wrongdoing and wrap it in redemption and overcome it with the limitless power of God. God's righteousness through that act of willfully going to the cross for my sin has swallowed up my brokenness. And in that sense, I have raised up the Son of Man. There's a third way to interpret this passage. And that is uh, that, that though it was my sin and shortcoming that has nailed Jesus to the cross, He did not stay there. He, three days later, went through the empty tomb and emerged on the other side, victorious over the grave through the power of of resurrection. That's what we celebrate on Easter Sunday is that God refused to let be the final answer what seemed to be the end. The end was not the end. The end was only the beginning because God has brought Jesus back from the dead victorious so that I too, so that we may share in that victory over the grave, that we may come to a new understanding of what life is all about, a new experience of abundant life in this world and eternal life in the next because God has raised up the Son of Man from the empty tomb. There's even a fourth way to interpret that passage. 
is that at the end of his life and ministry, at the end of his death and resurrection, Jesus still was not finished. Still, Jesus, the Son of Man, chose to participate in ascending to be seated at the right hand of the Father, where the, the, the author of Hebrews tells us he would be seated at the right hand of God to intercede on our behalf for all time. That is to say, no matter what you or I may be dealing with, whatever it is that we're going through, Jesus is on our side at all times. We have a, a, a source of encouragement. We have a source of, of power being spoken into and over our lives by Jesus, the Son of God, speaking to God on our behalf. And there's even a fifth way to interpret this passage. And this is where I'd like to spend the rest of our time today. The fifth way to interpret that passage is that some way, somehow, the Son of Man may be raised up for all the world to see, raised up so that others who do not yet know Jesus may see him and may come to know him. That he may be raised up so that every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and he is raised up by the living of my life and by the living of our lives. Jesus is raised up so that God may draw creation unto God's self. And that life can be experienced the way that God intends it to be experienced. As I sat there in the coffee shop, listening to this conversation of broken relationships, and a young man who so deeply wanted to be accepted and a mother who so deeply wanted to see what was best for her child. And as the distance only grew between them, as there was this elephant in the room in the name of the other brother, I was reminded of the depths of brokenness that sometimes happen in our households, in our homes, in our workplaces. As Deacon Ray prayed a moment ago, in our nation, in the commonwealth. There are places in our world where people are at war with one another within the same city, within the same country. There are ideologies that have chosen to be combative with one another rather than to be harmonious toward one another. And again and again and again, in this place of hurt and in this place of difficulty, you and I have the opportunity to lift up the Son of Man, to lift high the name, the love, the cross, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We can raise him up. GBC, that's what I want us to think about this year. If there's, a, if there's a certain theme, if there's a certain verse or a phrase that I hope we will commit to memory and commit to being part of the foundation of our living in 2017, it's this. Raise up the Son of Man. Raise up the Son of Man in our words, in our living, what we say and don't say, what we do and don't do, in the way that we make decisions as individuals, as households, and as a church, let us raise up the Son of Man so that all the world may see and know of His love. And there's a couple ways in particular that I want us to think about it. If you've already read my newsletter for this, for this month, my article, you know that I'm, I'm asking us to reopen our vision document. Five years ago this month, we started working on GBC 2020, the vision document that has served us so well. I don't want to do away with it. I don't want to scrap it. I just want to reopen it and make sure that it is still the, the most current, best way that we can encapsulate what it is that we believe Jesus is calling us to do in this church and in this community. I just want to make sure that we take a moment and, and, and ensure that it is the best representation of the way the Holy Spirit is leading us. So that's something we'll be working on. There's a couple other things I want us to think about as we pray about raising up the Son of Man. The second one is, I want us to think about how we share the gospel. How we share the gospel. How we share the good news of the love of Jesus Christ. Because let me tell you, this church does an exceptional job. We're, we're, we're as good as, as any and, and better than most at sharing the love of Jesus. 
We will put into action this call to be the hands and feet of Jesus, but where we are very limited, and where, frankly, I as your pastor am very limited, is lifting up the name of Jesus. This is something we need to work on. So that in addition to being faithful, as faithful as ever, in raising up the love of Jesus, we make certain that we are lifting up the name of Jesus as well and sharing with people that He is the one. It is He specifically, it is He uniquely who is the answer. One other way that I know already that I hope we will work on raising up the Son of Man is what I was feeling in the coffee shop that day. There are real hurts in our communities, in our homes, in our hearts, in our relationship, in the commonwealth, in our nation, in this world. There are real, heart, real hurts. And I want us to do everything that we can possibly do to ensure that we are offering real support, caring and convicted responses to real hurts in our world. And that will be a part of what we're doing this year. There's a way that we can do this, and, and, and I want to close with this challenge and, and this, this encouragement. There's a way that we can do this starting right now. Once again, our congregation has been called upon to host an event on behalf of the community. We've been asked by the Martin Luther King Day uh, board of the who all's on it? NAACP, Georgetown, Scott County, Georgetown College, I forget who all's involved in it. If we would host the program tomorrow. Now, there's a typo in your bulletin. The, the march tomorrow at 4 o'clock does not begin uh, on the college campus. It begins at the Ed Davis Learning Center uh, over on Chambers in, in Boston. It's, it, the march is there at 4 o'clock, but the program is here at 5 o'clock. We are the host church. I will have the opening prayer. I will have closing remarks and a closing prayer. We'll go downstairs for fellowship. Let's lift up the Son of Man in how we host the community. Unless you've been living under a rock for the last couple of years, you know that there has been incredible violence in our streets, incredible division in our community, not just ideologically, but, but violent division in the streets of America's cities. It is no coincidence that our congregation has been called upon to host this event. But let me tell you what lifting high the Son of Man does not look like. It doesn't look like tomorrow afternoon the house of worship of Georgetown Baptist Church being filled only with guests in a worship service. Lifting up the Son of Man tomorrow afternoon looks like the people of God known as Georgetown Baptist Church, the congregation, the individuals that form the church, gathering in the house of worship and hosting our sisters and brothers of all stripes and all backgrounds in this place in worship. It will be a Christian worship service. I have the opening prayer, I have the closing prayer, and then we'll go eat. That's as Baptist as it gets. If you need chicken, I'll bring chicken. I will bring the Baptist bird. Let us lift high the Son of Man. And so this event is built as a, as a time of unity. Let it be that. Dr. King's own nephew will be here to speak. Last year's Miss Kentucky will be here to sing. Let it be an opportunity for us as the people of God known as GBC to receive the people of God of whatever background they may be as we together lift high the Son of Man. In closing today, let me say to those who will soon be seated in these seven chairs, our new deacons as well as all those who will be serving as deacons again this year, this is what we're asking you to do. This is who we're asking you to be. We're asking you to be servants who will lead us 
into these types of decisions and actions, who will use these types of words, this type of language. We're asking you to help us discover and rediscover how to raise up the Son of Man. It's to that call that we commission you today. It's to that high purpose that we rededicate, that we recommit ourselves today, each one called in his or her own way. But there may be others today who have never surrendered to the first form of that call. And so today we want to give you an opportunity to do that. If you know today that for the very first time in your life you are ready to say yes to the work of Jesus in your life, ready to receive Him as Savior, ready to receive Him as Lord, ready to follow in His footsteps and be made into a new creation. We want to ask if you'll make that decision known. As we sing this next song, will you simply step forward? Share that decision. Let us celebrate with you that you're ready to follow Jesus. Others of you may recognize that you've been going it alone and now it's time to be in faith fellowship with sisters and brothers like this because you too are ready to raise up the Son of Man. And if that's your calling, if if you're surrendering to it today, then we as a church would love to welcome and receive you. Others of you may be be responding to to something else that, that the Lord is putting on your heart today. However it is that the Lord is at work in you today, we stand and sing in hopes that you'll come. May we...